Hello and welcome to the podcast, We Are Selling. Last week, we started our conversation about is it ego or info in the area of social media marketing. And we had such a response that I've actually got him back on air today, Mr. Jonathan Creek. He joins me again. Jonathan, welcome back. Thanks for having me, Lee. It was great to uh, speak to you last time. Yeah, we've definitely got people's attention. They didn't know there was so much to this and that the platforms are changing. And today we're going to go deeper as we talk about the science of story as your superpower. Take us into this. Well, I think the first step for people to understand is, you know, there's a lot of noise on social media where people say story, 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 you know, it's the power and they talk about it. But a lot of the people who are talking about it don't really understand what the power is. And the scenario is with the story and the science of it is that as a as a business, as a marketer, as a, a real estate agent, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get people's attention take them on a journey to the point where they trigger an action. And hopefully that action is they pick up the phone and call you with with a potential listing or looking to buy a property that you've got listed. I mean, it's sort of, yeah, it's just a business system that we have. The understanding of the science of story is understanding that the brain is built in a certain way and it wants the information delivered in a particular sequence in order for you to get to the end point where you can trigger an action. And I think probably the best example of it is if we've been to the movies. Now, Lee, I'm going to ask you a question, and you need to be really honest with me, okay? Okay. Have you ever cried at the movies? All the time. Right, you cry at the movies all the time. Why do you cry at the movies? There's a a moment of emotion, could be win or loss. Uh, Quite often it's triumph, I I suppose. Uh, I cry at the voice, Jonathan, when I'm watching the voice and I hear someone sing. So, yeah, it's that moment of winning. But when you go back to the movies, the people in the movies, you know, they didn't really win and they didn't really die. You know, they're actors who are getting paid tens of millions of dollars to pretend to do it. But your brain doesn't see it that way, right? 100%. And this is the science and the trick to storytelling is that you can get the brain into a position where it actually believes what it's watching is real. And that's the key to science. If you've got to move people into this sequence where they think that something's real and then it triggers a response. Now, in movies, it triggers crying. It can also trigger laughing. It can also trigger people jumping out of their chairs and cheering. It's It's flicking that switch that's deep in the brain that then allows a physical response. And that all comes from emotional buildup. Now, the journey to emotional buildup is a tricky one. Now, if we go back to one of my favourite movies, Raiders of the Lost Ark, we don't really care that much for the people who die at the start of the movie. There's no emotional buy-in. They die and you go, well, they die. But near the end of the movie when people die, or if you go back to a couple of the Star Wars movies, they like someone to die at about three quarters of the way through. We actually really care. And it's because during the movie journey, we've built up an emotional connection to these people, an emotional buy-in. Now, this is a science that we see a lot in Hollywood. They use a lot of story structures, which make sure that the science is on point. Um, Probably the most famous one they use is called the Hollywood plot. Now, there are people on the internet that try and teach the Hollywood plot to people like real estate agents, but it's just too hard to do. If you've ever been in a Hollywood movie studio, there'll be 30 writers sitting there, and they're all focused on like 10 minutes each, making sure that they get that science right. But if we go back to Aristotle and the ancient Greeks, he made a much easier story framework, which also taps into the science of the brain called the three-act play. And if your listeners are interested, I can throw a link to you, Lee, that you can put in the description and they can download a copy of the three-act play at the end of this, or they can find it on my website. But here's the scenario. Think about when someone sends you a piece of content or you're sitting in front of a television, they need to grab your attention. Now, If you buy a ticket to go to the movies, you've got a bigger amount of leeway in how quickly that movie has to grab your attention before you make the decision to leave. And that's usually because the ticket and the popcorn's so expensive, you're prepared to stay there for a bit longer or even sit through the whole movie, even if it doesn't really grab you. You just leave it and go, well, that was a bad experience. It was a terrible movie. But on social media, the viewers have more power. If you don't grab their attention within the first eight seconds, they're out of there. 
They're thumb swiping. It can be even shorter for some people who've got shorter attention spans. They just flick through and flick through until they find something that catches them. So what you've really got to do is you've got to catch people's attention within the first eight seconds. Now, once you have their attention in that first eight seconds, you've only got that eight seconds to open up what I call a curiosity loop. Now, once you open a curiosity loop, it means they're going to hang around for a little bit longer in order to find out the answer to something. I call it starting with a problem driven by a desire. So you've got to open up that story loop. The thing is, though, to build the emotion which flicks the switch, as I spoke about down the end, you've got to have time for the emotions to build up. So you then need to take your viewer on a bit of a journey, give them context to the scenario and the position. Now, don't panic, agents. This isn't that hard to do. It's a little bit complex when you hear it the first time, but it's not that hard to do. So you just got to have them bake a little bit in the journey. You don't jump straight to the answer. If in Star Wars, Princess Leia had got the plans to the general straight away about the Death Star, the movie would have ended in 10 minutes. There needs to be a bit of a journey. What they're actually doing is building up your emotional buy-in. The other thing is once the brain recognises that it's getting this curiosity loop and you're taking it on a journey of emotional buy-in, it will block out all other distractions, which means you're going to be locked into that content for longer. Now, anyone who's got kids will recognise this scenario in their children constantly. Now, for me, it was me sitting in front of the television watching cartoons as a kid, and my parents would walk through and say, hey, you've got to go get ready for sport. You know, you, we've got to go in 10 minutes to get to the footy ground. And they'd come back seven minutes later, and I'd still be sitting there in front of the television, and they'd raise their voices and yell at me and say, come on, Jonathan, you've got to get ready. We've got to go now. You're sitting there in front of that television. And I'd turn around, it would be the first time that I heard them for the day. And I was like, why am I getting in trouble? Why are my parents going zero to 100? I didn't hear them the first time because I was so engrossed in the stories, particularly Disney, that my brain never even heard them. It blocked out their distractions. Now, real estate agents can do this with social content too. So once you've blocked out the dis distractions, you build up the investment of emotions. Now, once the emotions reach the switch in your brain, you can flick the switch. And you can manipulate what that physical response is. It doesn't have to be crying. It doesn't have to be, uh, it doesn't have to be laughing. It can be as simple as having them like the video or comment on it or share it or even pick up the phone and give you a call. Jonathan, what makes videos go viral? It's a great question, Lee, and it's one that I, uh, I gave myself when I left uh, mainstream media. I gave myself six months to find the answer of what makes a video go viral and it actually ended up taking me three years of research. And in the end, I built an algorithmic formula where I'd sit people in a room like market research to work out why videos go viral. So just imagine this for a moment. I was doing some work for one of the big banks with what I call the spread factor formula, which is I, I teach it nowadays to people. But I used to uh, sit people in a room. So we're at the Rod Laver Tennis Centre, the function centre then. We had about 100 women aged between 40 and 50, and they were launching a new mortgage product. And this mortgage product was aimed just at these women, and they had three different videos that they were going to put out on Facebook to attract people into this business. Now, I can tell you, they play the videos, and they had a scorecard from me, and they'd tick boxes across the steps. And the boxes across the steps would spit out a score out of 100. And if the score was over 80 out of 100, we knew that they were going to share that video. So we knew that that would be the one to put onto Facebook because it would then spread and it would spread amongst what we call the filter bubble. Do you, do you know, have you ever heard of the filter bubble, Lee? I've never heard of the filter bubble. Right. The filter bubble is how Donald Trump won the US election. And what he understood is how social media platforms gather data and put people of like-minded data together. And so if you can get a piece of content that scores out over 80 out of 100 on the spread factor and you just drop it into one or two people in a particular filter bubble, they'll share it to everyone else in that filter bubble. And so rather than Donald Trump going out there and trying to win everyone's votes, he just went out there to find big enough filter bubbles so he could win enough votes. And if you watch, a, there's a documentary on Netflix about a company called uh, Cam, uh, Cambridge Analytica. And if you search it up, you'll find it. And it talks really deeply about how this company did it. And what that was all about was 
it sort of ties into the research I was doing is that if you can find these like-minded people and trigger them in the same way, they're going to share and spread that video. Now, the key to why videos go viral is 100% about how you leave people feeling. And we spoke about it in the last episode when agents are making ego versus informational videos. If you're making ego-based videos, think about how are you leaving them feeling if you're there spruiking about how good you are. Yeah, this Started. is very, very important. And, you know, if we have a scenario or an example now that we want all the potential home sellers who know all the potential home sellers who want to prepare the home for the market, sharing the videos that you are in the channel of, how would you create that filter bubble for something like that? So you build it up over time. So here's the problem with agents and how, well, people generally who use social media for business is on the weekends, they don't. So you've got to understand that these social media platforms are purely data-driven machines. They're just gathering data on who interacts with your content and who doesn't interact with your content. And so if you think about, um, uh, you think about having a video that you put out to 10 people, uh, and Facebook, for example, Facebook, out of those 10 people, will choose one person to have a look at the video first. And if that person scrolls straight past that video, it won't show it to the other nine. But if that first person does watch the video and then you can trigger the emotional buy-in in them, whether you get a like, a comment, or they share it to their friends, that then triggers the edge rank in Facebook to say, hey, this is a good piece of content for this data set of human. And so then it will find the other humans in your 10 that are more likely to interact with that piece of content again. Because you've got to understand their game. Their game is to keep more people on Facebook for longer so that they can serve up more ads. They've got too many ads already, Facebook. So what they're looking for is content that engages data sets. So the more content that you can build that that first person then shares to the next ones, and what they do is they don't just share it to one, they share it to two. So you go from one to two. If those next two still interact, then they go, oh, this is great. We're going to share it to another four. And so then all of a sudden you've got seven people out of the ten who have seen it, and then it stops. They don't share it ever to 100%. And the more you do that, the cleaner your data gets. The problem that we have and the problem that I have with the agents I work with is that they're really good Monday to Friday in cleaning their data for a platform like Facebook and then all of a sudden they'll just throw in random stuff over the weekend that dirties the data. So we have That's to have really strong Yeah, we have to have really strong conversations about, you know what? You've got this asset of social media. You've got your 1,000 friends and followers, and they're, they're all living in houses, so they're all potential clients. What's worth more to you, mucking around with your mates on the weekend and posting stuff or actually making this work as a business? Would it hurt you too much to go and start a personal separate account somewhere else? And that's what we do. Wow. So take us into the difference of these platforms. So, for example, Facebook versus LinkedIn versus Instagram. They're all platforms, but they perform differently? Yeah, they do. They do def definitely um, behave differently. Instagram's really funny at the moment because they've been playing around with it. Traditionally, Instagram was a photo-based uh, platform. Then a couple of years ago, Mark Zuckerberg decided that Instagram was going to go more video, uh, and that was in a move with Reels to take on the surge of TikTok. And so they went down that path, and then that sort of threw their hardcore audience out. And so now they're sort of responding back to them, and we're seeing Instagram come back to photos a little bit more. And Reels, even though it's embedded, is sort of still it's sort of becoming its own ecosystem. Um, so they definitely behave differently. I think the one thing with Instagram is very hashtag heavy. Um, so don't be afraid to use hashtags in there. But my tip with hashtags on Instagram would be you've got to not use the same hashtags every time. If you've just got hashtags saved in notes on your phone and you copy and paste them into the first comment or you copy and paste them into the actual description of the text and they're the same every time, these algorithms are so smart. They know that you're being lazy. They know that you're just trying to hack the system and get a few extra cheap views or, or exposures. Um, so you've got to be really smart. And, and probably the greatest piece of advice I can give you across all these platforms, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, the more human you can be, the more human to human, 
that you can make your connection. So that means not having things too polished, which sounds weird, particularly for high-end agents. They, they get really scared, and you see their eyes open when I say this to them. You know, the more human to human you can be, the better off you're going to be. So a lot of these high-end agents, Lee, they'll say to me, yeah, I'll be telling them, look, you've got enough pixels in your pocket. You can just use your phone for these videos. Like, just sit in your car and talk about this topic. You know, you share your expertise, and they'll be like, no, I need a camera crew. I need a sound guy. I need, you know, I need to spend money on this video for it to be good. I can tell you, my research into viral content very quickly indicated to me that money wasn't the way to win. And the reason that I learned that lesson is I, I produced the greatest viral video no one ever shared. That's my great, that's my claim to fame. I've written, <laughs> I've written a book. I've done a TEDx. Um, yeah, I've travelled the world speaking on stages. But my probably my greatest claim to fame, because it gave me this light bulb moment, was I spent a lot of money creating the greatest viral video no one ever shared. I posted it on Tony Abbott and Kevin Rudd's Facebook pages. It was in the height of WikiLeaks. People who have watched it have gone, yeah, that is an amazing video. It's probably the best piece of filmmaking I've ever done. But it's not shareable. It, it left people feeling sort of all angst and torn up a little bit. And they're like, I'm not sharing that on my face. I don't want that reflecting on me. And so that's why they're not ever going to share ego-driven content. Now, if you're a real estate agent and you're standing there with a family say, hey, I just sold this house for 250000 above reserve. What a great result for me and what a great result for my, for, for my vendors. How in any way is that shareable? How in any way is that helping anybody? Where if you stood there and said, hey, I've just sold this house, and you make the house part of the story. Hey, I've just sold this house. It was an incredible result, but this is what it speaks to for the bigger picture. This is what it speaks to for this area where this house is situated. This is what it speaks to for the opportunity that exists here for other vendors if they're thinking of selling. Now, that's way more valuable and probably going to get you a lot more business. So they just need to change their thinking a bit around the content that they're making and the message that it sends. Jonathan, LinkedIn, no one's posting yeah. photos of kids on that one. So it's very, it's, it's like a business networking function. What's yeah. some of the tips for LinkedIn if you are using LinkedIn as a real estate channel? I've got a love-hate relationship with LinkedIn, Lee. I'm going to be really honest with your listeners here. Um, you know, I've been a premium member for a long time. I am not anymore as of about a month ago. Um, LinkedIn really, I think, is a great platform if you are posting consistently daily. You have to really be consistent daily and you have to get into their groups and contribute and um, leave comments and start discussions. It's a real discussion-based one. The thing with LinkedIn is I just hate all the notifications. They're not good enough at stopping the spam. You know, the amount of emails I get from digital agencies overseas wanting to put me on a rocket ship and build me a million dollar business ended up driving me mad. The, you know, the incessant messages about work anniversaries for companies that I shut down in 2013 were like, you know, it just ended up driving me mad. My advice across all the platforms, LinkedIn, Instagram or whatever, is you've got to understand and feel the zeitgeist of the moment. And if you are a real estate agent, there's two things you put in any post across any platform. A, that you're talking about real estate, and B, what's your patch? Because the algorithms will position you for that. They will work with you to do that. So with um, with the way that LinkedIn works, it really is a network network. And look, you know, if you're a high worth agent or dealing with high worth properties, LinkedIn's probably skewed towards you. There's probably no doubt about that. And if you can use it to make relationships and build trust, great, do it. It's no different to Facebook and Instagram. It's that process of, A, grabbing their attention, sharing stories with them of value that they're curious about, the problems that they're trying to, they're trying to solve, and then give them a lesson of value at the end. Then you're going to start forming relationships and they're going to start connecting with you. But here's the really interesting bit on the data, Lee. A lot of the agents... Uh, a lot of the agents that do social media really well, what we see is they're not actually transacting with the people who are following them. So your audience or your business transactions aren't within your followers. 
It's there. It's your followers' peer-validated referrals to the next friend along that brings you the business. So what you're actually looking to create on social media is an army of referrers. So if you've got Jenny and Betty down at the coffee shop and Jenny follows you and Betty's sitting there saying, well, I'm just about to get divorced. I'm going to have to sell the house and then I need to buy another one. Jenny, wanting to be helpful, is going to sit there and say, well, I know a really good agent. I follow them on Facebook. They're excellent. They're amazing. They're dynamic. I think they could really help you. Jonathan, great information. You're now helping the real estate industry full time. How do people get hold of you? You can reach out to me on my website, virable.com, V-I-R-A-B-L-E.com. And I'm across all the socials, at Jonathan Creek, you'll find me. Um, Yeah, I look forward to hearing from anyone. It'll be great. Jonathan Creek, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Lee.